I'm here today to talk a little bit about our, our Marcade, our Charlie Marcade. It has been a, a time, some will say a couple of years, and that's a true statement. But I want to give you a little bit of background on what we've, what we've worked on and why we worked on it. Originally, the Charlie product first came out, it was originally conceived as a point blank weapon, going from one point blank to another point blank, uh, depending on the weapon system, uh, being center hole, rapid deployment, and so on. And we're only, we were initially only talking about 15 MOA, 20 MOA. And then some people at Atrocy First told me the magic number, oh, we need 30 mil. And the second we hit the 30 mil, we realized we were starting to hit the edges of chromatic aberration and other issues that we would, we would struggle with as far as using a standard prism, even with high index, low index glasses. We're going to start hit borderlines at some point. So then we came out with, as everybody knows, the Charlie unit and different versions of the Charlie. And no sooner than we made the 30 mil unit, the very month we were in our first production run, we had calls for 50 mils. Then we had calls for 90 mils. At this present moment, the biggest unit we've made is 1,200 mils. And the next generation Charlie versions, we're actually going to be shooting for 2,400 MOA. And of course, at that point, you had to employ other items like the Delta to go with it, because now you have to look around a barrel. But we found that the marketplace just moved very rapidly beyond anything we conceived initially. So in some ways, this is exactly what we've applied to the Mark 8. Now the Mark 8 is a little different. Uh, it is still using components of the Charlie. It is using a similar mirror system, but now one has to be constantly movable. And while, yes, I can dial the Charlie and be bolted down, in this one's case, and it is a, it is a true click, that's one click, two. I just moved 600 them away off those four clicks. And it is very, and we are working with, you know, people saw me hanging on to it. You know, we, are, we will work with the spring pressures, but one of the goals is we look at this and go, who's gonna use it, why are they gonna use it? Well, our, our biggest market to date has been ELR, and this, this unit will be ultimately capable well north of 800 MOA of movement through an adjustment, just like we see here. We also recognize that the military applications are very different, and we've been on military bases, People will take a Charlie and drop it on their rail versus turning the turret. Even if they were only turning one revolution, they'd drop a Charlie on because of the simplicity. So we recognize on the military side that instead of being 100 MOA values, it might be 10 mil values as she walks around. 10 mil values shoot a reticle. 10 mil values shoot a reticle. 10 mil values shoot a reticle. And therefore, you, you never come off, come off of your, where you have your rotation. You're moving much larger ranges, much faster. And there's a, there's a fast, easy practicality. And just like all the other Charlies, when it sits on the gun, if it goes bad, you didn't lose your scope. There's no batteries. There's, another, no, there's no immediate interface that takes the Charlie and affects your optic. And yes, it's going to be just like a little Charlie. As I rotate it through its value, your cheek position won't change. You're going to still be on, and as this unit goes through 600 MOA, you're still sitting here at your value, moving through 600 MOA. Or, if this is a military version, it'll be 10, 20, 30 mil, or 20 MOA values, or one revolution of a, of a turret, and so on. Now, uh, this is an operating unit, and we shoot it. And uh, it's, it's one of my prototypes that you tear apart as an engineer, and put back together, and tear apart, and put back together. This um, the Charlie brings a new whole new series of issues to the table. It, uh, we are not looking for 100 MOA to travel, we're looking for 600, we're looking for 800. And it's got to track truly through that distance. And initially, we were looking at, you know, we'd speak to people and we'd say, hey, you know, if we jump uh, 100 mil, people would say, you know, well, how accurate is that? I'd say, well, within a quarter mil, a quarter mil, you know, 0.2 mil, 0.3 mil, and they go, oh, that's, that's pretty, pretty poor. It's 0.3 over 100 mil. And the question is, 100 mil, what percentage is that? It's a very, very low percentage. But we also recognize that people were having a concern at those values. So we said, well, how do we hold it better? How do we get this to, to track within single digit arc seconds across 600 mil away? Now, now that comes into other issues. And we've been through all different designs, you know, the original Charlie and this turret here's third or fourth generation. We've used, you know, micrometer heads, precision ground threads, steel bushings, 
large diameter uh, uh, thread, thread systems. And one of the things that we found on the big thread systems is that they just wouldn't handle it. The, 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 the recoil bent, they weren't handling the wear. We've worn out several thro thread systems relatively rapidly. And the reason being is, if I'm looking at a standard turret, my thread is vertical to the system. It does not, its recoil is perpendicular to its movement. And the advantage of that is, thread doesn't see any forces to speak of that want to pull it apart. In our case, the recoil is in alignment with the thread. All the, all the forces are actually loading the thread both directions. And in this case, we have to be able to swing some degree, in some ways, 10 degrees, and hold similar loads on our system, keep it loaded so there's no play in the system, have it go into recoil and return to position. Now, there's no such thing as an absolutely rigid system. Uh, as you add, continue to add rigidity, we're also going to create other issues in the field called interference. Any, anything gets into a dust or harbor. So what we had to do here is, what we introduced was a series of ABEC-5 and ABEC-7 bearings, large diameter precision angular contact bearings, to the handle, to the bearing systems that let the, let the, let the mirrors rotate. And uh, we also went to all carbide tips. All our contacts are carbide. Uh, due to the loads we're actually loading this with, we're actually loading the, the assemblies with 40 to 50 pounds of pressure instead of, we're not ounces here, we're ounces on movement here, I'm 40 or 50 pounds here because of, again, my recoil is working against me. It's in my direction of that I'm trying to hold everything in line. Now, my movement is perpendicular, which works in my favor, but the recoil is in line and ounces at 50 Gs become pounds, and therefore, how do we, how do we control it, how do we move it, how do we put it back in position, and also, how do you preload a bearing? All bearings, no matter how, how, what they are, need some kind of preload for position. They can't float back and forth. Uh, a thousandth error in this is one in the way you're target. 2,000 yards or 20 inches. So I can't have that thousandth of play within the system. It has to be taken out and put somewhere. So that's one of the, one of the things that we look at is how do we load the system? How do we make it so it's not offset and, and, and um, uh, not applying a, uni uh, a, a consistent load around a center that's not offset to one side wanting to twist the system? And, you know, even, even something like this, you go, boy, that's a big handle. Handle, Yes, it is. It's because if I'm in the field, I have a glove on, I want to be able to reach forward, I want to be able to grab that, give it a twist, and also that click, it's there. You do not know that you're in between. It's, you can't be in between. It, it drops into place, she's done. We'll work with this in, uh, as far as how tight that has to be for the field. Or to an ELR shooter, they might say, I want, the, I want a heavy click, I want to know it's never moving until I grab a hold again with almost a pipe wrench. But as you see, we're not using a pipe wrench here. But it's these, again, we've, we're kind of, we've worked through all those little issues, the issues of thread, what movement is, what slop is. We've uh, this unit, uh, on my auto collimator, I have a Nikon auto collimator. It repeats within the, with, right at this present moment within the width of the crosshair across this 600 MOA. And with the carbide tips, I'm looking forever. I, I believe in uh, a correct surface. My background is precision machining and how to re-index something onto a surface again and again under production modes was always one of the harder items to solve. And therefore, we look at these load points the same way, that when we see the load, the surfaces have to make contact. They have to work in such a way that they are a precise contract, but cannot get loaded up with dirt. They can't be loaded up with grease. That no matter what, full contact is made and you know exactly where you are. And little things like that are, are forcing into geometries, a couple modifications for geometry to get this thing to fully function where we want to and where we want each contact to point, sit within the turret as, as, I, as I index it. And, uh, and if we can, we're gonna apply, get a dead zero into it. Right now, one of the points is dead zero. This has eight setting points at this moment. Uh, it might, we might be able to raise it a little bit. But I wanted to give you an update of where we are on this device. And we'll be shooting it some more this weekend. Actually, we're gonna be uh, graduating out of the territory the 375s on it, and we're gonna get a shooting with the 416s. Uh, I, I certainly have and don't expect anything to even, even show me a little bit of a whimper of, of movement. Um, 
and I'd be, I'd be able to return to zero. And that's one of the things this is gonna be able to do is you will have the option of shooting it on the gun from zero. You will not have to put it on afterward. You can leave it up, you can shoot zero at 100 yards and dial it from there and never touch the vice. And again, it's transferable because 100 and away is 100 and away, 200 and away is 200 and away on any given scope. Uh, for those people out there though, if it, to make full use of this, any, any of these devices, of course you want the big rail. It, if, if this was, this Night Force scope has approximately 120 plus MOA or about 32 mil of travel, so let's say it's 30 or 100, I'd want to have a rail that takes, makes use of that so I can go 100 MOA movements. If I have a scope that's only capable of 40, well then I'm probably only going to want 40 MOA movements on my, on my dial, which is something we can build, we, we put in place. Um, can it be adjusted at some point later? Yes. But it's not, it wouldn't be taking full advantage of what the unit could apply to you. So just a little, little bit of a thought process of how would you want to build a gun, build the big rail into it initially to accept the unit. And the answer to this is there's no overlap. You have no gaps, unless you want to shoot gaps. Um, but you, this is zero to 600 MOA without a, without a spot. Uh, we've had bigger ones put together so far. Our biggest one is 800 MOA so far. Uh, but I have to we have to decide now Who's going to buy that and how many versus what does the market want now and what can we sell today? So any, any thoughts, any input on that? We'd be happy to hear from you. And we look forward to seeing this out in the field with you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.